coming up on Man Enough. Once Jalen began to fully express themselves, like it was new for me. And Jalen has been a great teacher because all the work we do around the man box and masculinity and breaking out of the man box, you know, the glue that keeps that man box together is homophobia and heterosexism. Mm -hmm. So we're always unpacking it, but to live it and to really be prepared for it. I mean, I was as prepared as a father could be. Being man enough, what does that mean? It's really manly to mess up, admit you're wrong, and then grow. I couldn't accept that I was evil. So maybe I'm broken, but those broken things could be corrected. Intimacy between a father and a son is me just wanting to like put my head in your lap. I love you, son. You haven't called me a benevolent sexist, but my experience is women are better. Even if it's a positive, it's still not equality. I don't blame men for that. I just blame the system. This is Man Enough. Hello, friends. Welcome to Man Enough. Yes. Hi, Liz. Hi, Justin. <laughs> <laughs> What's up, Jamie? Oh, I'm just happy to see you both. Mm -hmm. Liz looks so wonderful in her yellow. I know. I'm, well, you're both in gray. You guys are in simpatico. Yeah. We are. It's like, I don't know why I thought of Ghostbusters when I saw your jumpsuit. Ooh. But it's like, because it wasn't yellow, but there's just something bright. Ghostbustery about it. She's wearing like a yellow, a bright yellow jumpsuit. What is the Ghostbusters theme? Um, you, you can't it. make me sing it. You don't dun, just dun, do it. Dun, 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 dun. <laughs> Did you produce that record? Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we have a lot of fun. With that, I'm the oldest person in the room. All Not the just we; it's also our entire group of friends does it. Yeah, yeah, that's what I mean. Yeah, you know. And what I realize is, what I don't like to show is that when people have fun with me being a grandpa soon in my age, every time it's said, I act like I'm for perfectly fine with I it, am. but it makes me feel something. It mm. Makes me feel like I don't know, less than mm. something, and I don't want anyone to know that. Hey. Um, so anyway, but we're starting it off already so, with, with, a, so with a little nod to it. So, um, and because you shared that, would it be helpful? Would you rather me not make those jokes? No, it's all good. No, 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 for real though, because no, it's a very easy thing. No, to No, because do. actually what it's prompted me and allowed me to do is own it. And instead of uh, feel less than or not enough or too old or something of that nature, it's like, you know what? No, I'm, I'm going to... I'm going to say this out loud. Mm -hmm. So now when you do it next time and all my friends do it, I'll be like, damn right. Mm -hmm. I'm proud. <laughs> Lucky they, me that I got a few more years on you and I got, you know, something. And it's only funny because you look so young. You realize that. He, re like, he that's looks, the he acts joke. young. So anyway, so, this is not an episode about yeah, that. No, no, I'm really grateful you shared that though. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Jamie. I'll just monitor. I'll pick and choose when we jump in. But, I love you. But, um, okay. I am very excited and grateful this for me personally and i know for you as mm -hmm. well but for me personally this is a very very special episode mm -hmm. and i know we always say like oh we have a very special guest and we always do our guests are very special but today is very special um because this man um and his child are here grown child uh and this man i consider not just a friend but a mentor and I can honestly say if it were not for him and his love and his kindness and his support and his three decades of doing this work, that I don't know if this podcast would exist, honestly. I don't know if we would all be here and um, reaching all the people we're reaching. Um, and that man is Ted Bunch. And I'm so grateful for you that you're here. And I will never forget, I was, I was called, I, they asked me to do my TED Talk and I didn't want to do it. I did, I did not feel like I was worthy, like I was enough. I had not been I had not been in the gender equality space for long enough. I didn't know what I had to offer. I had this platform. I was a celebrity kind of, and th that's why they wanted me to do it, and I was willing to talk about it, but I didn't feel like I had anything really to say. And this man, who is a hero in this space, welcomed me in. There was no like uh, that like man, machismo, masculinity stuff. No, he welcomed me in. He said, brother, we need you. Mm. He gave me time and he shared space with me and he helped me and he gave me ideas and thoughts. 
And he's been doing that for me ever since. When mm. I have a speech, when I'm, when I'm wanting to impact young people, I ask him about the work that he's doing in his research, and he always stops. He gives me time. He read my book, and he gave me notes. He printed out every piece of paper. He couldn't just read it on his computer. He printed it out, and we talked about it for hours. Mm. And, uh, and I love him dearly. Mm. Um, and the work that him and Tony Porter do at A Call to Men. Um, and I am so excited to meet Jalen, uh, Jalen Bunch, um, who is here as well. Uh, mm. Just thank you both so much for coming on, because you've been a father to so many people. Mm. Um, and, uh, and now we get to see what that looks like in action. <laughs> yes, so Ted Bunch is an author, educator, activist, lecturer who's internationally recognized for his efforts to prevent violence against women while promoting a healthy, respectful manhood through his work with an incredible organization we all love and support uh, and encourage you to love and support A Call to Men. He's leading a voice on issues of manhood, male socialization, promoting healthy manhood, and preventing violence against all women and girls, and he does it so beautifully. Thank you. And Jalen Bunch, a multidisciplinary, non-binary queer artist from New York, currently studying musical theater at Berklee School of Music. They've appeared on notable stages like Radio City Music Hall, <laughs> Carnegie Hall. They were in an original off-Broadway play called Stranger Sings, the parody musical. And they're currently directing the Vagina Monologues in collaboration what? with V, wow. formerly Eve Ensler, incredible, um, at the Boston Conservatory. Thank wow. you so much for coming uh, <laughs> and spending time with us. Thanks. It's very, wow. very incredible to have and, you both here. And by here. the way, uh, congratulations, Ted. Uh, 20 years of A Call to Men. Yes. We just celebrated in New years. York together. Yes, yes, and thank you for being there and gracing us with your presence. My and your honor. wonderful wife, Emily, was with us, and we were so excited. People are still talking about it. 20 years yes, of 20 years. this incredible work. Before we, right before the camera started rolling, um, I saw you put your your arm on your mm -hmm. on your child mm -hmm. and sent love and you guys looked at each other and that was like really sweet to just see um and I'm curious can you just tell us what that was about what what was that connection that you were making just then hmm. well um gratitude love um Pride, um, appreciation, uh, you know, being a father and modeling the best version of myself that I can to all of my children. And especially, I think Jalen, because he's taught me the most, they have taught me, excuse me, his pronouns are they, them, have taught me the most about authenticity and um, vulnerability. So um, it's wonderful that I get to practice that. And so that touch, um, I've always been an affectionate father like that always, but um, the touch is important. And it was just letting him know, he knows what it means. What do you, what do you think that that, what, what did that mean to you? Excuse me, they know what it means, <laughs> forgive me. Um, uh, I feel like a lot of, my dad and I's relationship is very unspoken a lot of time, and it's something that I really appreciate. I appreciate having someone that I can just be quiet in a room with and not feel like I need to talk. Mm. And mm. Um, and me and my dad are the same way as in, and I like, talk to my friends about this all the time, actually, randomly, just that we'll be in the same room together, and we will, he'll give me a touch or I'll give him a look and we both just understand what that means and we mm. don't need to say anything and uh, it just goes a really, really long way. I mean, like since I was a kid, he, it's always been like when I go off to school, it's always been a touch or when I'm going off to school because he knew that I'd get a little embarrassed if he yelled, mm. I love you, mm. he'll look at me and go, I love you. Aww. And, um, and he'll make me have to say it back to him and be like, I love you too. <laughs> it's just always been an unspoken thing that has uh, always allowed us to feel very understood. That, and I think that's what that means. I love that. There's a lot of pressure to, um, to get pronouns right. Um, and I know I, I 
pause for a second because I had never said a word for the child of of somebody who was non-binary. So I didn't know in my head, like, oh, wait, but you're not a child. You're more than a child. But I actually don't know what the word would be for someone who is they, them. So I was thinking to myself, oh, is child the right word? I hope I didn't offend them. And then when you corrected yourself, it, it made me feel like I could take a little bit of a breath. It was no big thing for you. You're, you're just like, this is my daddy. And I'm sure for a, a lot of their life, they were your son. And so there's still like this this um, Reprogram. reprogramming that has to happen. I just appreciate the space that I felt there. You know, look, generally, if something like that happens on a show, let's just be real. Most of the comments we get that are like angry about misgendering come from like cis white people that maybe are feeling like they need to defend. I rarely see that from non-binary or trans folks um, who seem to have a lot more compassion and s space given. So I, I just wanted to just mm -hmm. speak that Appreciate and acknowledge that. that. And I, I, mm -hmm. I don't think I've ever heard a father uh, correct himself in that way mm -hmm. and the grace you gave. I just thought that was really sweet. Mm -hmm. I mean, when my when I came out as non-binary, my dad, the first the one of the first texts I got was, "Am I still allowed to call you my son?" Mm -hmm. And I said, "Of course you are. Like I, I am still your son. I mm -hmm. just uh, identify otherwise because I like in my head because." My dad has always called me his son, just as like a nickname in general. It's always been "Hey, son." So I'm like, this is more of a pet name and a title rather than a gender identification for me. Mm. Yeah, it's relationship based. Yeah. Oof. Yeah. I'd love to unpack these things. I don't know if we want to go there now or mm -hmm. yeah. So thank you, and I do think that it's important part of my own development and growth as a father who's learning more and more around what it means to, around gender mm -hmm. and around parenting. And um, so Jalen's been wonderful. We have a great relationship and I'm, and I'm clear with asking Jalen about things like, and he knows that I'm coming from a place of really wanting, excuse me, they know that I'm coming from a place that, um, that I really want to support them. And um, so this pronoun because I'm thinking individual, but it's really plural, right? It's not singular. So I have to make the switch, and I don't always catch myself. And so the safest way, parents, mm -hmm. <laughs> is probably just to call them by their name, Jalen, mm -hmm. Jalen, Jalen, opposed to trying to even struggle with the pronouns. Mm -hmm. And um, so, I'm, so I'm, I'm, I'm working on that. And it's really important. I was on a Zoom this morning and um, talking about allyship, and that uh, I have he and him as my pronouns on the Zoom, and this is with corporate space. And I was really sharing around what allyship is, and it could be performative, right? And that's a performative thing, but it's not that someone who was on Zoom wouldn't necessarily think that my pronouns were other than he and him. So I don't necessarily need to say that for me, but I need to speak to what's not being said, what's not mm. visible. So bringing out the invisible that that is not just about a binary. There's much more gender expansiveness there. And Jalen has been a great teacher um, of what that is for me. And even in the work that I do, because all the work we do around the man box and masculinity and breaking out of the man box, you know, the glue that keeps that man box together is homophobia and heterosexism. Mm -hmm. So we're always unpacking it. But to live it and to really be prepared for it. I mean, I was as prepared as a father could be. For I can't think of anybody more prepared <laughs> for, yeah. than Ted Bundy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and and right. even with that, once Jalen began to um, fully express themselves, like it was new for me, right? Because from the time he was two, I was like to from, excuse me. From the time Jalen was two, I was like um, really expecting that he was going to be gay. And, and I'm going to say suspecting, expecting, right? Mm -hmm. There was an expectation, and I was excited about it, actually. I thought it could really be, I'd be, I think I may have said to you one time, I think he was, it was, um, he was being bullied in school. It was like seventh grade, sixth or seventh grade, and the school psychologist called. I knew what the bullying was about, and, uh, and we had talked about being gay. I knew I could hold that space. Like, mm -hmm. I can give all that love. I got a lot of love, and I can give it, mm -hmm. I, I, can, I can hold that space. So... While I thought I was ready, when Jalen actually began to fully express themselves, 
Because I remember, you know, I take all my kids to the nail salon, pedicures and manicures, all mm-hmm. of them, right? And uh, you see all of us come in there, right? <laughs> 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 it's something else, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. It, it, uh, so, because there, there's, there's, uh, there's, there's three, three other male-identified y- kids, and then there's J- Jalen, who's gender non-binary, and then there's two... Um, uh, female identifiers, so all the guys come in there, and Jalen, we're all there, and it's it's just cool. But <laughs> but I remember they wanted to get their nails painted, and as ready as I thought I was in my mind, I was like, oh man, mm. I, hope, is it, uh, I hope it's black or purple or mm. something dark, mm-hmm. right? Mm. And I had to put that in check, like that's my stuff, right? And I forget what the first color was, but then the next time we went, it got a little brighter and brighter. But by then, I had made the adjustment because it's me. It's not them, Mm. right? It's me. It's my stuff. With all the awareness that I had, I also wasn't prepared for everything. And a lot of it has to do with safety, right? Safety, being bullied, being picked on, being Mm -hmm. a black, queer, young adult like all that that means and around his safety. So anyway. Mm. Mm. Wow, beautiful. I think one of the most remarkable things about the you know your story together is that Jalen um, talks about not actually coming out to you, but actually just becoming yourself and, and being truthful to who you are. And to me, it connects so much with the conversation around masculinity, where I think it's most, I feel like I can get through men or, or they'll, again, feel uh, m- more receptive to, to these messages if we talk about how the man box gets them away from who they actually yes. are, mm-hmm. right? Yes. So can you talk about that, Jalen? You know, what it was that, because pro- I think it's a revolutionary way to talk about coming out. I think coming out is this burden on queer people. Um, but can you speak to, to what it meant for you? Yeah. Um, so I dated girls for a really long time. Mm-hmm. And then as I started to pull away from that and people started to feel that and I was like, I've always been a more effeminate person, but I was always like pushing that side of me down because I was doing a lot of sports. I need to be rougher and tougher and more violent. And I just wasn't into that. Like there was one point where I actually remember distinctly I was, I was maybe like, 10 years old and I was in football and then I started getting afraid of being tackled. And that was like a moment that I was like, okay, mm, something's different here. And then I was starting to get into theater and stuff and I was subconsciously embracing more of my feminine sides, but you know, still dating girls. And that felt like, okay, this is how I am latching still onto my masculinity, even though Mm -hmm. at this point I was having thoughts. And the people around me were starting to catch on to that. And that's when the bullying really started. And I left that school, went to high school, went to a Catholic high school, which was interesting. I was there and I felt that being in theater especially and being black in theater was really a point of I can't sacrifice myself for anybody else. Like at the end of the day, I'm going to be in a box, so I might as well look good while I'm in the box. (laughs) And that was really a moment for me where I was like, okay, this is, I I was learning to latch onto my blackness and solidify myself in my blackness because I was, you know, being told by doing theater that I was being less black, that I was appeasing the white man. Then once I graduated um, and was able to not be in Catholic school, not to wear a uniform and fully decide on what I wanted to be perceived as every day, I had come out as gay and I was really like trying to, you know, come into myself and, you know, no one was surprised. I was changing my hair and doing all this stuff and just being more outward and presenting myself energetically more outwardly. And Mm. it became for me that like, you know, you can accept me or you cannot. And if you don't, that's not my responsibility. That just means you're not someone that's meant to be in my life. Mm -hmm. And um, and then there was a, a moment in one of my classes and we were going around asking for pronouns. And then I said they them on accident. And then, and I like stopped myself and my teacher was like, 
are are you are you sure? And everyone was looking at me and and it for the first time I was like I was, you know, scared about saying that, but I was like, yeah, I'm sure. And you mm. know, I've been they them ever since, but for like two years before me realizing that I was non-binary, where I was um, really realizing how, even though I felt that I was really, you know, going against the grain, I was still stuck in these very heteronormative ways of thinking, which I thought was so interesting. Like, what's an example of a like way? an ex of mine? is the one who really brought it up to me in that in a gay relationship, there always ends up being a mask and a femme person. And in my Virgo rising brain, I was like, okay, it has to be that. Like if I am dating somebody and they're more femme than me, I have to be masked, I have to be dominant, okay. I have to, you know, I would go to work and then I'm like, okay, can you clean my room for me and then <laughs> come back? And then if it wasn't, I'd be upset about it. Mm-hmm. And, um, and I had not realized how much how upset I was about all of that and um and then it was when we broke up that I was talking to my ex again like after two months and they were telling me that like they were like you know you made me feel very belittled and you really were keeping me in this one place that I feel like I couldn't grow out of Mm -hmm. and you know for this reason we're not getting back together but like it uh made me feel stuck I wasn't allowed to be feminine. My my, my partner wasn't allowed to yeah. be masculine. And mm. what's interesting is that you felt that with a dad like Ted Bunch. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right? Yeah. yeah. Which shows, you That's know, to what... people who are listening, yeah. you know, who didn't have, like, uh, even a, such a great model um, – to, for you to struggle with that, even, even with the best model in the world, um, you know, shows how ingrained these things are. Yeah, and I, like, I, I fully, like, I, I was, like, they told me this, and I was so shocked. Mm-hmm. I had no idea, especially being, like, in, in an environment that I grew up in, in with my family, where, you know, embracing your femininity and all that parts of you is so awesomely accepted. I still was mm-hmm. having my own things that were holding me back yeah. from really understanding myself. And once I realized I was non-binary and came out as such and really started to embrace that part of me, then, like, I don't know, everything, like, I, I feel like I became softer and just more welcoming and receiving to all parts of everything and not feeling, or, like, rather, I'm also now more conscious of what I am now doing to uh, I, how I, I am keeping people in boxes or trying not to Mm -hmm. and really trying to be more um, outward about that. I really appreciate any chance to dig into some of this stuff because I feel like there are so many listeners, but also just people in general that um, are learning, are learning, but also don't know where to learn and are not able to ask questions because they don't have anybody in their life who is non-binary. And, um, and as we know from having Alok on our show, when uh, when they said we need to have compassion over comprehension, right? You don't have to understand somebody to love them, um, which is the problem. Like we have so many people around our country right now with all of the anti-trans bills and various things, where there's just no um, no space for love first. There's no space for human first. It's just straight up. I don't understand non-binary. I don't understand trans. Therefore. Mm-hmm they're not people or that doesn't work or that's not real. Mm-hmm. I think it's just important that, you know, we, we open that conversation. So for you, I'm just curious, what does it mean to be non-binary? For me, being non-binary means to be nothing and everything at once. Mm-hmm. It feels like I am I embracing like all, like every single cell and part of me with whole heart and without restriction or preference and discrimination against any other side. Mm. I feel like it's what I choose to present myself out in the world as. Like, I can, I'll wake up one morning and I'm like, okay, I'm having a femme day. I'm gonna do this, that, and the third. And for a while, me, for me, being non binary was just putting on a skirt and walking out and calling myself femme. But then I realized that it's more of the energy that you exude. It like, I want you to look at me and be confused. Even if I'm wearing a suit 
and you're like, that is a gentleman, but there's a question mark at the end. Mm. And Interesting. Um, is it almost? Uh, mm-hmm. It's almost like the the antidote to the to the gender war in some way where it's like it's it's what your your dad has spent his life trying to break men free of the man box and in some ways it's as if hmm. um being gender binary is just it's flipping it off mm-hmm. it's a rejection as if it's a response to the boxes that we have put men and women in and I don't, is that even right to say? I don't know if that's, but but just based on what you're saying, is what it feels like. It's like a, well, fuck you. No, I'm not going to be that. I'm not going to. I refuse to to be this thing. And you know what? I refuse to be that thing. I'm me. Exactly. Um, tell us quickly why a call to men. Now we we know that all of us, everybody, has work to do. Um, women, non-binary, all genders have work to do. Um, all races, everybody has work to do. Um, but. We know that men are um, in a position of power um, that others are not. And, um, and we have the ability to oppress and to keep things alive and hold people back. So I believe this is part of the reason why the work is around men. Um, so we can be transformed. Correct. Um, tell us a little bit about it. So, yeah, Across Men, we founded it 20 years ago, Tony Porter and I. And we was really born out of actually the battered women's movement that we were both working, I was running the largest domestic violence program in the country for domestic violence offenders, 600 men a week, all court mandated men. These are men who were violent and violating the orders of protection, those kinds of things in New York City. And uh, it became clear, Tony actually came to me with this idea, um, because he was doing similar work in upstate New York. He came to me with this idea around um, talking to men, really, looking at the issue of violence, discrimination, sexual harassment, all those things, looking at it and going upstream to preventing it from happening in the first place, prevention, right? Because while if we look at domestic violence or sexual assault, for example, while the overwhelming majority of violence against women and girls and the queer community actually is men's violence, most men are not violent, but we're silent about those that are, and that's as much of the problem as the violence and abuse is. In other words, those men are actually counting on us not to say something so mm-hmm. much so that if I see a man hit his wife or girlfriend and I walk over to him and I say, knock it off, what does he say to me? Mind your business, right? That's our collective socialization. Mm-hmm. So we wanted to go upstream to speak to the silence that if most of us are doing the right thing and think we're living the best lives that we can, that let's peel back some of that and talk about why aren't men confronting other men? Why aren't men challenging other men about what's happening? And that really has to do with our collective socialization, that we're taught that we lean toward giving men the benefit of the doubt, that we are taught to see women and girls as having less value than men and boys, that we're taught that on some level women are the property of men, and we're taught that women and girls are sexual objects. That's, in the, that's embedded in the uh, socialization of men, mm-hmm. of manhood, of patriarchy, not embedded in our DNA. Mm-hmm. That's really important. Like it's not about, this is not innately in us. It's actually something that we're taught. So we just started doing this work and we went deeper and wider. And as we're unpacking and pulling back these layers, we're getting more into, well, it's really around masculinity, manhood, how we're taught, how we pass this teaching down to our boys, male privilege, entitlements, all of these things. And so that's how A Call to Men was really born. And we have a way of doing that that doesn't indict men simply for being men. And it actually, very important. That's yes, very, very important, important. Very important. That it's an invitation and not an indictment. And it's not about calling somebody out, but calling someone in. And we believe that um, we're all swimming in the same water. We've all inherited whatever it is, these constructs that we're operating from. We've all inherited this stuff. And that these rigid notions of manhood and masculinity are not only harmful to women, girls, and the queer community, but also to men and boys. Like, it's all connected. We wanted to work to create a world, and this is our vision, to work to create a world where all men and boys are loving and respectful and all women, girls, and those in the margins of the margins are valued and safe. And so to your point, Jamie, we, we know that men are the key to it because we hold the resources, we hold the power. If women could have ended violence against them, 
would have happened already. <laughs> if if black folks could have ended racism, would have happened already. Mm-hmm. Like those who were in dominant, the dominant culture need to um, take responsibility for those behaviors. Mm-hmm. I love it. I, I feel like too, because you had said that this is stuff that we've, we're, we're not inherently this, mm-hmm. but we've learned it. And a lot of people have said to me, uh, people say I was taught it. And then they'll say, well, I was never in a classroom. My parents didn't teach me this. You tell me when I learned it. Unconsciously, we hear these things. Like I was thinking about songs. You know, there's a couple songs I just cannot stand. I've never bought it. I don't listen to it deliberately, but it plays on the radio when you go to the supermarket. It's going around. And then one day the song comes on and I know all the words. Mm-hmm. I never <laughs> listen deliberately Such to it. Such a good example. Mm-hmm. But I know all the words to it. Yeah. And because you hear it and right. then you've learned it and now yeah. you start repeating something. What Andy Grammer song are you talking about? <laughs> He's everywhere. <laughs> um, although his words are actually inspiring. But um, <laughs> so this is what happens to us as men as well. We're not just taking a class on this and going, okay, mm-hmm. this is how to be but we are getting all these things that we then start repeating before yes. we know it. And it's in the air that we breathe. Right? That's right. It's like the, the hum of the refrigerator. You mm-hmm. don't hear it until you pay attention to it, mm-hmm. right? They say, oh, yeah, it is on, right? Because when we, when, we, when we talk about these things, it really is, well, here's an example. Just end this sentence for your audience, right? Young uh, six-year-old boy learning how to throw a football with his uncle, big brother, coach, gym teacher, and that man says to him, you have to throw harder than that. You throw like a girl. Right? You know the answer to that. doesn't mean you believe it, that girls throw, don't, don't throw well, right? Because mm-hmm. girls throw just fine. But if you know the answer, then that's that collective socialization. That's what, we, that's what you're talking about. We know th- these are the things that, we're, that mm-hmm. we're all taught. So what does that little six-year-old boy l- leave that circumstance or that situation that interaction with that adult, that person who he's trying to please while he's throwing that football. Does he leave that interaction thinking girls are equal to him Mm. or less than him? Mm -hmm. Well, less than, how can he not? Mm -hmm. And we do this all day long with different messages. And if you don't live up to this man box, these these hyper-masculine rigid notions of manhood and wind up wanting to be in musical theater as Jalen opposed to football Mm -hmm. like his brother then somehow you've fallen short and we're going to penalize you for that Mm -hmm. right men are going to in particular we're going to penalize you we're going to humiliate you we're going to see you as less than because you're closer to again heteros Mm -hmm. uh you know when we look at sexism and heterosexism all connected Mm -hmm. homophobia all connected because you're closer to what a female or a woman a girl would do than Mm -hmm. what a man does in this binary thing and that's against the rules mm. and you're going to be punished for that yeah i appreciate so much how you're holding space um, dad he's looking at ted yeah yeah sorry i'm looking at ted <laughs> um it's so interesting because when we started you had said that you um expected Jalen to be gay mm-hmm. at two yeah, i did i wonder if there's some unpacking in this mm-hmm Try to ask this question, so let me, let me try to get to it and do it in a way that I, I'm still learning a language. You know, if, if, you, if you had someone that's black, dark, dark skin, mm-hmm. we call them black. If someone's a little lighter skin, they're still black. Mm-hmm. As soon as you say to them, well, you're not black because you're light skin, now who am I? Mm-hmm. Now we have to find something so I can have an identity because mm-hmm. you just said I'm not black because I'm not. But we know that's, that's some contract that doesn't mean anything. I wonder if... When our two-year-olds, boys or girls, are behaving more effeminine than your other child, if we don't put a box and say, well, I expect you to be this or that, or that you're not a boy, you're not a girl, you just, there's many different colors and different shades of who we are. If I have a son who shows certain qualities, but I still say you're my son Mm -hmm. and embrace them and champion them Mm -hmm. for having what's considered female qualities. Mm -hmm. Really, but they're not. They're human qualities. Right. And they exist in you, my son. And I love you. And you're perfect as you are. And other people may say you're not a man because you exude these qualities, but you are. And they're embraced. And then you, your identity is never questioned. Rather than saying, I expect you to be gay. It's like, you're just who you are. Does that? Do we also then push people into a position where they then have to identify with something else? another sex because they're not accepted and embraced for being exactly who they are. Mm-hmm. 
Do, do you know what I'm trying to say? I, and and, and so, I, it's, a, it's a delicate question because yeah. it then takes away. I'm not trying to take away someone saying, I am non-binary. I am, I am this, irrespective of those qualities. But I do know some people that I feel were forced mm. out of what they may have not been forced out of had they been embraced for the mm. very nature of yeah. who they were. I mean, yeah, no, I think, because I mean, definitely, because I feel that, I mean, gender in general is a society con is a societal construct. Like it, it only exists in our minds. And so I feel that, you know, me coming up out as non-binary was response to how um to the standards that are expected of a man. Right. And those standards are are, are right. crazy yeah. anyway. Yeah. So it, I feel like it allows like I mean like I work with um it, over the summer, I work with a lot of kids, and all these parents will come in, and their child will identify as they them. And I and a lot of people are like, "Oh, you know, you're trying to push this narrative on them." But I feel that it's better to start there. It's better to start in the middle, and then allow your kid to decide. Okay, I want to actually, I actually am he him. I'm actually she her. Right. Or I'm still they them because I still feel that I am equally of both. And so I I I do think that you know uh, I'm about to get canceled by the non-binary community. Um, I do feel mm -hmm. we're all getting that, canceled. Hey, yeah. Jalen, we're all getting canceled. That's um, the name of the episode. But I, even I that, do feel that this it's is, a response. This, no, but this of, is this is an of, important of conversation. Yeah. So, this sorry, is important. Sorry, I, I didn't hear we're the We're allowed. Thing that you said. This is where we where we learn when we can have conversations that are meant with respect and love and care. And I don't fully understand i'm trying to work through it will you help me why i help you with a white person who's black and has an experience and if we do it with love and care this is maybe where we can grow without yeah. the fear of being canceled yeah. and i hope yeah. you feel can i can i offer something just as because this is an important conversation but it's i think it's the any definitions create issues right even the yes what gender non-binary even creates an issue mm -hmm. where if we were and i feel like your mom and I did this with you and tried to do it with all of our children, is that let, to let that child reveal who they are to us. Mm -hmm. now, it wasn't around gender or anything else. It was around his older brother was an athlete, slept, ate, thought, nothing but sports. And I think that part of going into football was some of that, right? My big brother. Even though when I say since two years old, because whenever, if the, if, if it's there all, was- It's also the fact that their dad has 25 Yeah, I was gonna biceps. say, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I can't even fit my arm. Look at my bodybuilder father. Yeah. Like, oh. So, so, I mean. <laughs> uh, so um, and I'd love to unpack the thing about getting old too, by the way, maybe <laughs> another time. But, um, so to create a space where that child just can, just can show us who they are, right? Okay. Because with, uh, with Jalen, when he was two, if there were a group of two-year-old girls playing and two-year-old boys, he it was more interesting to him what the girls what to them what the girls were doing. It just was, and I didn't have any judgment on that. So I was like, okay, you want to do this, you want to do that, you want to do this, you want to do that. Sure, you know that's fine. And so it was really, and then the creative arts thing started to come up, and singing and dancing and acting, all these things, and you could see the light in their eye change when they were involved with those things. So it wasn't football or lacrosse or anything else, right? So I think we have to expose our children to a lot of things and see what they grab onto. Yeah. And um, uh, so I didn't have judgment around that. Their mom didn't have judgment around that. So I think that that really allowed yeah. not only to flourish, but to be healthy in that flourishing. Because sure. what often happens, and I see this, and um, one of the other children who um, I have I hold space for as a father um, was a friend is a friend of came to us as a friend of Jalen's who she's with her her mom Erica her, yeah Erica yes but, and and but her father passed away when she was very young but I think that what Erica is also um, gender non-binary she's queer and um, and felt something at home and comfortable where she could lean in and say, call me dad, and like lean into mm. that, right? And so like we have to create that space for our children. I think that's really important. And then 
because there's so many children who wind up getting kicked out of the house, wind up on the street, wind up having to sell their bodies in order to survive. Like there's so much around these queer kids that all this pain and hurt and disapproval and not belonging and all of these other things that we really have to, it just doesn't make any sense, you know? And the parents, dads in particular, anyone listening out there, like we miss out on so much. Like we're missing out on a lot, not just mm. the child, but we're missing out on so much. So, so I do think that if we create an environment where the kid exposes us to who they, who they are. For Joshua, it was sports. For Jalen, it was creative arts and all the things that went along with that. So, mm-hmm. so I don't feel like I directed it in any way. And um, I felt like I allowed space for Jalen to show us who Jalen is. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And when you're queer, and, and uh, I can speak as a queer person, like queer, being queer is like the least important part about me in a way, in the way that I view myself. Like I'm so much like I don't think about that all the time and I think part of why I came out so late is because I I came out when I was in my 30s as as like bi and I was like I'm bi but I'm not like that bi like I don't need to like it's it's, it's one of many things that that are important to my identity but because society says you must be straight and everything is organized in that way or again according to the gender non-binary it becomes this like this this identity that I wonder if it's yeah it, it it takes up more space than maybe even people want it to take up in their lives does that make sense yeah Where, like you're a performer you're you're so many things yeah there's and, so much more yeah there's and, so much more mm-hmm. and yet yeah I know that it takes up space it's also we have to think about the country as yeah, a whole yeah, yeah. I'm not saying and this I, and is I, and I think bad. it's and I think it's also important to hold space for the conversation mm-hmm. because. The reason that it takes up so much space is because in some ways I think it has to because there's such a rebellion and an opposition to the fact that they even exist. Yes. So I just want to also make sure that it's like, it's yes, it's, it, yes. but it is And they're response. doing it on purpose, right? The, the people who are doing these anti-trans laws and, you know, they're, 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 it, it's a deliberate way to have us talk about it and then for them to point to to us um, and 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 tell voters, see, they don't care about you. They only care about no, this right. one, you know, portion of the population. It's it's a really sophisticated tactic, and, and I, so both are true, right? We want to talk about it, but we also don't want it to become no. the whole, yeah, yeah identity. Like, yeah. Yeah. And, and I'm trying to take responsibility myself, and just and and the question, by the way, Ted, with you was was not um, um, directly at at you, but rather mm-hmm. us. And I know some people that have children who are already saying when the boy is playing with girls or dancing, they say, oh, he's not really a boy. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Whatever, no. or, or, you know, or the girls, he's a tomboy. Or we already, because they express themselves in certain ways, then we tell them and start judging or that they're not enough or that they're not who they are, right? Yes. Um, and I'm not saying you did that. No, but, but I want to clarify do it, something and that, then. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Puts people on an island. Yes. So let me clarify. I'm glad you brought that up so I can clarify it because I, I wasn't clear enough. So that now we know our children. I know who Jalen is at two years when he was born to two years old to now. I know who he, who 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 Jalen is. And uh, I'm sorry about that. Um, and uh, mm-hmm. so I'm not saying that a child who's at two years old who may be male identified, who may be. Uh, right, who's sp- who's spending a lot of time with the girls who are in that space, that means that that child is gay. I'm right. not saying that at all. Of course not. But no. m- with my child and all the things that I knew and the energy and all the things that I just, I just was not surprised at right, all right. and didn't want to do anything that would shame Jalen about any choices or interests that he had. That, jeez, yeah. excuse me. That they had, right? Um, so, so that was that was my journey. Um, but that's not to say that every child who or any child who might find the femme things more interesting than sure. the masculine is. Yeah, that makes know. sense. I just think it's just such an amazing mm-hmm. conversation because it's modeling the messiness, and I think we need to be more messy. Yeah, I just mm-hmm. think in general we have to be allowed to be messy mm-hmm. and imperfect because. Uh, None of us have it all figured out. Mm -hmm. Things are changing. You're not gonna like intentionally misgender 
your child. No. You're in a fucking amazing dad, excuse my language. <laughs> and you guys love each other. And we're asking questions. And you know, there's even a part of you that's like, am I gonna get canceled by the non-binary community? Like there's so much fear around the conversation for you, for you, for me as a straight white person. Like it's, ju it's just, I love this because it's messy and we need these conversations right now. Because there, there are some black people that are not able to have the same conversation about race as maybe myself. 100%. There are some women that aren't able to do it the same way as Liz because they're tired and I don't have space for it. And other people have the patience. And I imagine that there are people that are experiencing your life and that are like, I don't have time and room because I'm trying to survive and I don't have time to educate you. And that has to be okay too. And then there are times in people like yourself who's willing to have the conversation. So it's okay to be messy with those of us who are, you know, well, uh, this couple, have that but, but the point of this platform is to be to have these exactly. conversations and to yeah, be yeah. messy. This yeah, yeah. this can't mm -hmm. this I'm not saying this can happen in every dining room, coffee shop, lunch hall around yeah, the country, right. but we exist yeah. to model the conversation so that it can happen in private spaces. Um and I just believe that if this conversation happened more, yeah. if we had more fathers like this man right here, and we led with vulnerability, I and held this space, I think that the world would look very different. Mm. You know, and the bravery that you have coming on the show, being with your dad, talking about this. I think this is exactly why we do what we yeah. do. Mm -hmm. And it's up to us to learn. In other words, when I mess up on the pronouns, it's not Jalen's responsibility to correct me. That's not that's it's on me. Beautiful. Right. And like this is really important that we don't that 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 we don't put that additional burden onto mm -hmm. to that particular person or to that group. And uh, we we have this wonderful family group chat. Um uh, I really want to join your family. Oh, man. It's, 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 I just want to be a fly on the wall. It's beautiful. It's uh, beautiful. Hey, can I just sneak in there it's sometime? It's beautiful. It's you beautiful. just like add Justin it's, Beldo, it's, just, for, just for like a it's day. It's beautiful. It's, it's beautiful. And we were talking about pr pronouns. And I remember when Jalen first uh, told me, um, it was probably six months, maybe, maybe, maybe not that much before he told everyone else. And I was encouraging him, you know, will you let your siblings know, will you let everyone know? And I think he came to me because, we, we, again, we have this, they came to me because we have this relationship. And, um, and then I caught myself and said, no, it's really like, let me go to our people. And she, I, I, I think I asked, do you mind if I share, share it with them? Because I felt like it was putting a lot on, he, uh, they, they didn't, do, they came to me, they didn't go to everyone for a reason. Mm -hmm. And that, so it's really like, while we also want to not, um, people have to make their own choices and we don't want to out, I'm talking parents now, we don't want to out anyone, we want them to make their own, and actually I didn't even feel like he was coming out, I felt, jeez, uh, <laughs> like they were coming out, I felt like they were inviting me in, mm. right? It's different, right? Mm -hmm. That I felt like they were inviting me in yeah. more so than they were coming out. Because I was ready. Yeah. I was like, let's have a coming out party, right? Which is interesting because yeah. your life has been about calling people in. And then you, and this is what I think is so special and yeah. why we do this work, why I wrote the book for boys, why you wrote the book for men, why you do a call to men while this podcast exists, is like you became a safe space. Mm -hmm. And because you became a safe space, they came to you. Mm -hmm. I have one observation. Yes. I have one observation that I think for, for anybody listening or for you even, just so you don't beat yourself up too much, mm -hmm. a lot of the times that you have quote unquote misgendered, which mm -hmm. I uh, and just said he over they, is when I see you thinking about a time, mm -hmm. right? True. And I just mm -hmm. want, so just, and I'm not a neuroscientist, That's but just true. based on what I know about neuroscience, you're talking about a memory That's and true. in your mind, That's true. They were your son, mm -hmm. so so I just want to create Thank some you. space for no, for you, I, I, so I that you don't leave that. this and be like, oh my god, I'm so sorry, I did this like 50 times, or for any listeners, because I'm watching a father coming to terms with um, his child's new um, pronoun, but a lot of the memories are cemented when yeah. when it wasn't they, it was he, mm -hmm. it wasn't it, it was your son when before they came out. So I just I just want to I just want I just want to I just want to share that, that. because yeah, that. we cannot be expected to then reprogram our brains overnight because for 18 years it was a he and that's fair and, and, that, and that's also why I try to like I'm not gonna ever 
get angry at my parents especially for it because I'm like I know that in your memory it is he and once I became they them I did become a different person yeah and it's okay to acknowledge that or to you know still see that person as he him because that's what I yeah. was and those memories are beautiful and, yeah mm-hmm. and I and mm-hmm. and I and I still and I still say that I mean even with like my dad calling me son like I was like I am still your son I've been your son for 20 years and I'm still gonna be your son I just mm-hmm. now I'm your son with they them on the end mm-hmm. that's so mature of you and so empathetic yeah, and great. I just want to acknowledge you for that thank you but I'd like to ask <laughs> you a question Ted and um just before I do I just got teary-eyed by you sharing that with him. Mm. It's one of the things I love about you. Mm. You held space for him. That you said that to an older black man and gave him permission to not feel um, like he was messing up or something. I don't know why it moved me. I don't know why I'm crying right now because you're crying. (laughs) And I appreciate that about you. Um, Ted, will you tell us, um, just to pivot a little bit, can you list five things Maybe, or it could be four or six, but I'm going to say five. Things that you think men need to unlearn. Uh, that, how uh, much time have you got? Yeah, right. <laughs> well, <laughs> how, much, how much time do we have left on this podcast? Well, I mean, like concise things, right? Right. right just right. like, like if you were to just give me a list, some things mm-hmm. I can go home and work on. So I would say that vulnerability is not a weakness, but it's a strength. Um, that you are enough Mm. and that we don't have to to attempt to prove to live in this man box or these rigid notions of manhood to live up to these things that are harming us and others that success is really an internal thing that beauty is an internal thing that um we don't need to measure ourselves by what we have or what we've accumulated or people around us or the spaces that we're in, that it's really an internal thing to be able to feel success. And that means loving yourself. Um, Mm. To unlearn that, um, that we don't need to objectify women, that it's not about the conquest, but about the humanity of women. You know, one of the things that, Tony says at the end of his TED Talk is that the liberation of men is directly tied to liberation of women. So um, that really resonates with me, especially around the objectification piece, and that um, that we are, as men, that um, we just don't have to continue to put up these defenses that we're continuing to, to really... Um, attempt to protect how really fragile we are. That's really what it's about. We're just fragile. Yeah, we are. We're sensitive. We're very sensitive. We're very sensitive. And that those emotions are there for a reason. So we want to unlearn not sharing those emotions, not embracing those emotions, not expre- expressing those emotions. So we'll be much healthier as a result. Suicide is three and a half times higher among men than among women and among male-identified youth than female-identified youth. And then queer youth, it's even greater because they're shamed and humiliated in so many ways. Anxi- anxiety, depression, all of those things are off the charts for men, all because we're not sharing what's really going on with us. Mm-hmm. And if we do that, you know, again, we're living about five years less than women as well, that we'll be healthier, we'll be better, we'll be more fulfilled, and we'll be our full authentic selves. And authenticity is really what it's about, and that's what we want from our children also. Just allow them to be their authentic selves. Mm -hmm. You are, you have, I guess I would love to know your advice for men who are listening about how to get gracefully divorced, um, how to be a badass co-parent, because Mm -hmm. you have this incredible, Mm -hmm. and I want you to share this, but, um, you know, you're co-parenting beautifully, Mm -hmm. clearly, we Mm -hmm. we see the result Mm -hmm. (laughs) um, here before our eyes, but you also adopted another child with your Mm -hmm. ex-wife, so so you're really, um, and and it's, you know, there's a... You you've adopted you right well, well so, so we have so right. yeah so officially one of them is uh, we have legal uh, guardianship over and we adopted him together two years after our divorce exactly yeah yeah after <laughs> being divorced uh, he was, you still he was, he was a teenager and then we have and then there's two other young folks Erica and Matt 
whose father had passed away, and um, I hold that space for them. Mm-hmm. Their father passed away when they were young. They call me dad, and and and, and for all intents and purposes, that mm-hmm. that's the space that I hold for mm-hmm. them. And he's, mm-hmm. he calls them. And I was and I, intru- I was introduced to Erica right, as right. this is his daughter. Right. right. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Justin was like, yeah. no, he's four yeah, kids. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. It's, well, it's it's beautiful. So it's three biological and then yeah. three adopted. Mm-hmm. I think wow. that's so so beautiful and and so different and and such a model for for people who are listening. So so what have you learned? You know, for for people who are co-parenting with someone that they're romantically involved with, what have you mm-hmm. learned from co-parenting with someone you're not romantically involved with? So, uh, and we were married. Jalen's mom and I were married twenty years. Wow. And um, and uh, grew apart. And um, but we were very clear that the children were the most important thing and f- we actually had many conversations to get to that point prior to our divorce therapy other things so there was a pretty healthy transition and all i can say is that love transcends everything like I went into this thing and his uh, and their and their mom also that love. It's about love, love for these children. We are in group chats together. We do we do activities together. We're doing. She's involved with a wonderful man who she loves. The kids love. I love. He's in the group chat with us. I mean, it's it's a beautiful, beautiful family. Mm. And I still look at my ex-wife as family. And she looks at me as family, mm-hmm. and we we move forward like that as well. So that's where I think that love is really the thing that heals everything. And for the men out there who are really having challenges, like it's so much easier to do it through love than through the tension and the animosity and the anger. It just is. Mm-hmm. So I really feel like it's on us that's right. um, to really do everything we can to create that space, hmm. right? How, how, old, how old was Jalen when you, you guys got uh, divorced? It's uh, 11, 10, 10. 10? 10. 11. 10. And, and um, because, look, the reality is that uh, far more marriages are going to end in divorce than in success, mm-hmm. um, especially in America. Yeah. Uh, and they don't all end up like yours or like Jamie, who is best friends yeah. with, his, uh, with his former wife, who's like... <laughs> another mom to his kids, his wife and his ex-wife are best friends. It's just nice. the sweetest thing. It's just like your family. Yeah, that's and in be. the Baha'i writings, specifically in the Baha'i writings, while divorce is strongly discouraged, we're told that if one does get a divorce, that love should mm-hmm. uh, transform mm-hmm. from that of a husband and wife into that of a brother and a sister. Yeah. Um, so I'm just curious, maybe for you, Jalen, do you remember that conversation and what was that like? Like, how did your parents do it maybe different um, in terms of when they split up when you were younger? Like, could you feel that there was still love there and how they handled it? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, like, I never saw my parents fight, mm-hmm. ever. Um, and it was more, I noticed it when, like, when I was younger, I would, my dad usually would be watching movies downstairs and I'd smell popcorn and I'm like, oh my God, I'm going to go watch a movie with him really quick. And I'd sneak away. And there was one night where I was going down to do so because I saw the basement light on. So I was like, oh, you must watch a movie. And I came down to the parents talking. And that's when I was like, okay, something's changing. And you just intuitively feel it. Yeah, right. yeah. I was, I was like, I don't know what You're really they're sensitive, though. talking. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I was like, I don't know what they're talking about, but it doesn't feel light um and then and that happened like maybe like twice but even even so like even then like i still had no idea because it also even when they even when they were having these arguments that felt uh not arguments these conversations that felt heavier um there were still whispers and so i really never understood it to be anger because i never saw it like as respect anger yeah. yeah and so then once um they told me I wasn't very shocked. How, how did they tell you? They you they came, they sat me and my brother down in um in my mom's room, and they were just like, "We have to tell you guys something. Uh, we love each other a lot, but you know we're gonna be living separate houses. We're getting a divorce. We still love each other." And my dad was like, "I'm still 
and he made sure to emphasize that he was he's still going to be literally five minutes away, which he is and was. Mm-hmm. Um, so it didn't feel like, and, and then it finished, and I had a moment of I was like I went back downstairs to like play my video games again, and I and I sat and and I didn't really understand what exactly it meant. And I think I still don't even see it as divorce, honestly, um, because the transition was really Mm -hmm. so smooth. And being that it was when I was 10, I I also don't remember those years all that well. So in my head, they've been co-parenting kind of all my life. Mm. The love... that they've had for each other has never changed, mm. and I've never felt that change. Mm. Mm, beautiful, and and so Love it and was respect. just for me. Yeah, and I was like, oh, I have two houses yeah, now. That. This is awesome. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I re- I remember that also, Jay. When when you, I remember you coming down the stairs. <laughs> there are a lot of amazing, wonderful people who end up in divorce. Yeah, who don't uh, water that plant correctly so that it ends up this poison, yeah. this yeah. thing. And what you obviously were able to do is to see the end in the beginning. So, like, I have said to some of my friends who are thinking about divorcing, like, okay, before you divorce, before you go there, let's talk this out. What would you like this to be if you divorce? Let's see four or five years ahead from now. What do you want it to look like? Yeah. It's not, and, and you put it out there, like, I'd like to have a relationship like what you just yeah, said. Man. I'd like to get along with my ex-wife. I don't have toxic stuff going on. I don't want to meet a new woman and have them hate each other and then the kids go back and forth. Okay, what do you think it's going to take to get there? Because if you don't do these steps, it will be that thing that you hate. Mm-hmm. So that's going to mean from this point forward, treat them with respect, yes. honor. Uh, make sure your children don't ever hear you badmouth yeah. your ex-wife. Make sure that like when my wife, who I'm married to now, came in, I said to her, by the way, you don't have to marry me, of course. But if you do know that my ex-wife mm-hmm. is always going to be honored, she's not going to be, a you know, there's nothing romantic, but I'm going to always honor her. And my son will never hear me say anything disparagingly about her. Of course. And what my son got to see was Natasha come in, my now wife, and say to him, oh, my God, I met your mom. She's so beautiful. Yes. She's so wonderful. Mm -hmm. And my ex-wife, Tara, said, hey, Nack, my son, you are so lucky to be around her. He then had permission to love both people because there wasn't Mm -hmm. that. I also help foster that. They yes. did as well. So it requires yes. work. And I've been witness to that. Yeah. I've actually been, we've had multiple friends going through potential divorces. And I've heard Jamie say, I don't care what she's saying about you to your kids. Right. You do not engage. That's yeah. right. I don't care how, because look, this is, this is, this is what happens. And I've heard, I've had, we've had many friends where unfortunately, w- based on whatever happens, their actions, we, you, n- no one ever really knows the woman says terrible things about the man to the kids. And Jamie says, I don't care what she says. Mm-hmm. You mm-hmm. do not say one bad word yeah. about your yeah. wife, about their mother to your kids. And if he's yeah, saying the same thing ever. that, that yeah. the kids are protecting you, said that the most important thing, well, what's most important yeah. for right. the kids? Don't pit them against or right. each other. Or use the kids. Use right. the kids. And it takes a maturity and we it make does. mistakes and all that. But you clearly have demonstrated that as yeah. well as your yeah. your your um, the mothers of your children. Yes. Um, and, and, and I didn't feel the need to win, right? Mm. Like, 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 like. Right. To, that's you another know? one. There you right. go. Mm. That's right. Because, go. because that, what is the win? The win this is, is this, is, this is the win. This is winning. Yeah. There's no doubt about it. <laughs> that this that is winning. group. T- yeah. Chat? Oh, man. Yeah. yeah. No, that, this that, is, that's winning. Yeah, yeah. This is this is winning. <laughs> and um, and so we don't. I didn't feel the need to always be right. I didn't feel the need to win. I just wanted to have love and peace and like to support mm-hmm. uh, in any way that I could right. because I knew that these kids were going to benefit from that yeah right and that therefore I would benefit from it mm-hmm. so yeah. so it's 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 been beautiful and wonderful, wonderful and I, and I've just been blessed and I appreciate the time with you all to mm-hmm. be able to share so, that too. so mm-hmm. sweet it's so so important and I actually you. actually yeah. love the whole idea you said you didn't want to win I do want to win mm mm-hmm. mhm but the win isn't about my win. The win is what's the collective win. Yes. Yeah. So if once right. you identify what is the win, right. now I want to win that. Yes. Mm-hmm. So therefore I do want right. to win. You're right. Yeah. As long as you frame right. it. Right. You're, with you're that. right. Not at the expense of her. Yeah. Agreed. I right. just want right. to win. Right. And then look, look the product right. of it. Yeah, right. Right. Yeah. Our show, right. If I win, she loses. That's right. 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 And if you win, they lose. Mm-hmm. That's right. Oh, no mm-hmm. doubt about it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And yeah. look, look yeah. at it right here. The fruit yeah. is yeah. here. Yeah, yeah. we see. Um, it. And we <laughs> set and me, men do set the tone from that perspective because oftentimes the tear has come from men, right? 
more often than not, probably, mm -hmm. I would mm -hmm. think. Mm -hmm. uh, if they're willing to look at it. If they're, mm -hmm. if, if they're, if, if they're willing to look at it. That's so, right. Not to say, hold on, well, and most, be, be, yeah. not to say I'm that the tear doesn't come from uh, right, right. from women because it this does, is true. and we know. But but it's important. One of the things I love Thank so much about clarifying. one of the things I love so much about um, getting to witness brothership um, with my best friend Jamie and with other men because other men come to us quite a bit um, and really come to Jamie, and I get to to witness some of the things Jamie says. No matter what a man is saying. And, and we have heard complaints and we've heard men being like, oh, she did this and she said this to my kids and she said this and you can feel the anger. No matter how bad it sounds, he'll always say, okay, but what's your part? Mm -hmm. I didn't do anything. No, 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 no. Mm -hmm. But what did you do? What? Sure, sure. And maybe she's right, but you're not totally innocent here. Mm -hmm. It takes two. And I really appreciate that. Yeah, that's and, being a and I love that you, that's being a real friend that you hold our brother's feet to the fire and you say, great. And that's the work that you're doing. That's right. Yeah. When we say a call to men, that's the work that you're doing, right? Talk, calling men in. Let's talk about how we can be better and let's uh, be accountable for that. Um, and that's, that's really and, and, important. And before we go, I want to, there's one thing that I want to ask you because, um, as you know, my book came out and you and I had yes. a conversation, a few conversations um, about it. Um, and specifically, there, there's something that I've been talking a lot about and, it, and I've been quoting you on national TV and interviews and <laughs> the work with The Call to Men. And it was a conversation you and I had. It was before I was gonna go speak. I don't know if I was going to Colorado State oh, or where yes. I was going. Mm -hmm. um, I remember. And I was like, hey, I haven't had the, the privilege of being in all these high schools like you have recently, can you tell me what's going on? Like, I wanna come in there with information because these were first year, um, first, first year uh, college students, so they were just seniors a few months ago. Mm -hmm. And you told me something that shocked me. And you said in, in your work all around the country, you basically were conducting surveys with all these boys before you would take them into the training program and you found that 78% of all of the senior boys did not know the definition of consent mm -hmm. and that yeah shook me yeah can we just talk about that for one yeah. second yeah yeah so um so yes yeah. so our, we have a live respect curriculum which is um life skills and well-being for boys and young men and it's focused on for middle school and high schools and the in our and we wrote it with scholastic and in so if the, you're listening to this and you work mm -hmm. with a high school please consider yes. uh, looking up a call to men and, yes. and bringing this program into mm -hmm. your school. Yes, thank you. So we surveyed um, kids from all over the country, affluent private schools, under-resourced public schools, white communities, black communities, indigenous communities, and we, and we did this survey asking questions as we're writing this curriculum. One of the things that we asked them was, can you define consent? And it was actually 19% of boys could define consent, it was 80%, eight out of 10, 81%, eight out of 10 could not, mm. could not define consent, right? Which explains wow, so a I've lot. so I've been, I've been uh, well, it's saying close, 78, it's well, no, yeah, it's I close, mean, though. 80 is a much more powerful <laughs> number than 78, let's just be <laughs> honest. Because I, I only so, know, because I got, a, I saw a lot of 78s in high school. Uh, so, wishing I would have seen those 80s. So, right. But that explains a lot, doesn't it? I mean, if we look at sexual assault in the military, very high. Sexual assault on college campuses, very high. Mm. Girls and women between 16 and 24 at the highest risk for being sexually assaulted because our boys think no means try harder mm -hmm. or get her drunk because they're not taught anything different. They're taught about the conquest. And you just keep going, keep going, keep going. Until After the yes. curriculum, right. After the curriculum, and only one lesson is actually, there's 12 lessons. It's on power, privilege, authenticity, healthy masculinity, the man box, gender rules, media. One is on consent and sexual assault. That number went from 19 to 75% could define consent. Mm. Do you know how much prevention that is? Do you know how many women mm -hmm. you have saved yes, from sexual assault? Not, not only women, but also the young men who would now be jammed up Right. I'm not yeah. excusing their behavior. Mm -hmm. I'm just saying that mm -hmm. their lives are not impacted also because they know how to interact mm -hmm. respectfully. They know now that her his uh, her. Yes. Or their partners. Yes. Wh whoever they may partner with yeah. needs to be at least as enthusiastic as his. Nice, mm -hmm. That if her body is rigid or if that person's body is rigid, that says something to you. Mm -hmm. it, it has to be a yes. It has to be 
uh, an enthusiastic yes. So, so yeah, the Live Respect curriculum is amazing, and our 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 boys just aren't taught these things. They're taught to objectify women and girls, and so. And our, we learn about sex from porn. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yes. Did your and I'm so sorry. I'm, I'm I'm taking up so much space with these questions. Um, I'm being selfish in this episode, so forgive me. Did your no, you're not. Did your dad teach you about sex and talk to you about sex? I'm uh, just curious. Yeah. Uh, and, and if so, how? I just want to know. Uh, a little, uh, not outwardly. It was more of I, from watching my dad, I was like, okay, this is how I'm supposed to be trying to do things. What does that mean? Just as in like, um, I guess with my dad, like I would go to, to trainings and things and watch him talk to people. Oh, you went to trainings? Yeah, I would go oh, to like some God. of his presentations oh, and stuff. Oh my goodness. And so, and then I was like, <laughs> I was like, oh, this he is, this wait, is, you this would, is what So he didn't have to teach yeah, you about yeah, yeah. it. Yeah. You literally <laughs> went to training. Yeah, I was like, I would <laughs> take all fair. my kids everywhere. That's so, not fair. But, but, well, <laughs> well, let me just, but the conversations I've had with, with, um, with uh, Jalen and Josh and 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 uh, Koch also the male identified youth, when they were starting to date was around cons- uh, that that I expected that this is a adult decision to have sex and that I would prefer you waited till you're 18. That's when we make adult decisions to even talk about these things. So now I'm going to have a conversation with you as if you're having sex because we also have to talk How about old? consent. This was well, you started. J- Joshua started dating at about 15 or 16. So when I saw they started dating, Jalen was about the same. About the same, yeah. Yeah. And um, so then I'm having conversations. Okay, now, this is what consent is. This is what respect and value is. This is what reciprocity is, mm. right? Be respectful if you have mm. a partner. Like, mm-hmm. yeah. Mm-hmm. Like, Liz not just there to serve Liz you. is all yeah, about yeah, reciprocity. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Smell right <laughs> now, now I didn't want them to engage any of the children to engage that early, but I also don't want them to, to be in a situation that now we're dealing with some really serious issues. Mm-hmm. So, um, so I, so I had both of the conversations: one around abstinence, and then another. But if you're not, nah. <laughs> this is what a condom so is. And so, what would, what would you say to parents who are maybe wow. um, Love it. who are afraid to talk to their kids about it and who maybe want to preserve the innocence for as long as possible because what do we know yeah. we know that 10 year olds nine year olds are finding porn the second yep. the second any boy in a classroom has yep. a phone yes your child yes. can be exposed yes. to pornography and i do believe that there is um there's an innate want for parents to just maintain the innocence of their children and at the same time i do believe that we have to prepare so what would you say to these we parents? We absolutely have to. We have to prepare. And the, and, the, and the porn that they're seeing is is extreme. It's not like, you know, when I was 10 and saw the Uncle's Magazine, uh, you know, it was like what you'd see in the mall for Victoria's Secret's ads. Yeah. You know what I mean? It, this is extreme. It's degrading. It's abusive. It's, it's very problematic. It also cuts them off from who they are. Mm-hmm. Um, so I would say to them that have the conversation with your kids. You have to have the conversation. And it's going to be uncomfortable. And I remember my kids were even kind of like, do we really have to talk about this as their, mm-hmm. <laughs> their hands are over their ears, you know? But yes, we do. And even if it means turning your back and that person and the child turning their back and just having a conversation mm-hmm. like like that's okay a lot of people yeah. are not having that yeah, yeah yeah but at least to have the conversation having them ask questions yeah. all of those kinds of things that there's no judgment you, you know you're not gonna be punished for anything you share with me that's one of the things i've always had with my kids like mm. we'll deal with whatever it is like you're mm. not gonna be you know you have like there's some immunity attached yeah. to being yeah. being honest, yeah. you, you know. So, so yes, those conversations have to happen. And if we don't have them, somebody else is going to. It might be yeah. the pornography site or other older kids who are going to mm-hmm. have them doing harmful mm-hmm. things. They know? will be doing harmful things. And yeah. if I can also add Unless to that, they. like, it is I – I want to even more emphasize that it is important to be able to hold space for your child, you know, as one. I feel like I would be in – a lot more different situations had mm-hmm. I felt like I could not go mm. to my parents yeah. and had they hadn't had these conversations earlier in life, even whether they knew I was doing whatever or not, mm-hmm. it's still important to hold that space so that when it does happen, you can still go to your parents and ask these questions yeah. and have your questions yeah. answered. So you've been in, mm-hmm. you feel like you've been in situations where because of your parents, mm-hmm. you've been able to navigate them. Yeah. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Oh, wow. Well, That's thank incredible. you. Absolutely. Yeah, so much. 
we always end with a question and I'm really, I feel like we're going to get a record uh, mm-hmm. in terms of the best answer. So um, what does it mean for you to be man enough? Or what does it mean to be man enough? Wow. Um, to embrace my whole self, my insecurities, my frailties, to uh, appreciate all of the things that I do bring, the characteristics I have, the um, um, space that I hold for folks. Um, so being man enough to me is really fully accepting myself. Mm. Mm. How about you, Jam? Um, I would say being man enough is being open to receiving, to accept and embrace those parts of yourself that you are trying to constantly put down. It's braver to accept your whole self, to present your whole self to the world than it is to shut it down and appease someone else because at the end of the day, only you can control your own experience and Mm. anyone else's experience is not your responsibility. Mm. And it's being mad enough is being brave enough to accept all those things about you. Wow. Beautiful. How that. proud must you be? Come on yeah. now. <laughs> so oh. Well, <laughs> you both are so much more than enough. Thank you. And uh, and again, thank you. Thank you, Justin. Thank you for welcoming you. me into this community mm-hmm. and for teaching me how to be an ally and what it means to fight. Mm-hmm. I really appreciate you. I appreciate you too. Thank really. you so much. You, I you've love helped you, me so much, man. Thank you. And we wouldn't be here if it weren't for you. Thank you. I, I love you. It. I love you too. Thank you. Um, all right. I got to stop crying on this show. So I, I feel like I got nothing left when I get home to my family. I cried all out here. Um, and I need, that le- I need to leave some tears so that my kids can see them. <laughs> they see them. They right. see them. They I'm see not them. apologizing for crying. I just need, I need, I need them to be, I got a model like Ted. Mm. I got nothing left when You're I get home. You're doing great. You're doing um, great. Hey, Liz, where do people find our podcast? <laughs> Menenough.com slash podcast. And, uh, and please support the incredible work of our friends yeah. at A Call to Men. They have inspired the work of Man Enough. Um, and whenever you're ready, uh, I know the president of this movie studio, you got an internship here, whatever you want it. Mm-hmm. I'll be right. back here tomorrow. Ah. And, since, I know, and, since, uh, and since I know you want to be a director, anytime I'm on a set directing a movie, oh, you can man, come and you can intern that. and you can shadow. That's beautiful. All right? It's on record. It's on, it's on record. <laughs> no, it is. And, and that He's president he was talking nice. about happens to be me. So uh, oh. it's on record from him. <laughs> this is a job and, interview. Oh, very nice. That's so you want an internship, anything. You, you, very nice. We'll, we'll, we'll oh, get, wow. That's you. good. All right. Something going thank for you. you. All right. Until thank next you. time, I'm Justin Baldoni. I'm Liz Plank. And I'm Jamie Heath. And this is exactly why we do Man Enough.